All right, let's step up our, the complexity of our models by doing two things. One, by simplifying our models, but adding a second species. Our uh, systems that we care about, forest systems do not, are not single species systems, even when we're talking about monospecific stands. There's always something else going on, something else present. So what we're gonna do here is learn, uh, learn about predator-prey uh, interactions. There are an alternative mechanism for constraining populations. You can constrain populations without having a carrying capacity here. And we're gonna contrast these particularly with, with uh, pests and pathogens because you may be inclined to think about pests and pathogens of trees like predators. And sometimes there are some similarities, uh, but, not, uh, but not always. Um, this is an example of a disease, uh, pitch pine canker and bishop pine um, in Point Reyes, and it illustrates two problems. Number one, this is mostly a single species stand, but there is something here affecting mortality of these species, affecting the stand dynamics, so there's that. Um, and then second, uh, just to illustrate, I just wanted to point out um, and reiterate that point that this analogy can take us a, a, some some distance to uh, a distance in terms of understanding pests and pathogens, but we're mostly talking about actual predation. And what's predation? Well, the easiest way to think about it are things that eat other other animals and consume entire other animals and bark beetles and plant pathogens don't necessarily do that you think about you know big cats or wolves or, or sea stars and a lot of what's understood about predator population dynamics actually comes from studying these kinds of organisms it's still relevant to us so hang on hang on to your hats um, and then again you know just going to point out when it's possible that predator predation dynamics can be related to uh, this these Lotka Volterra uh, predator prey models sometimes, and that can help us understand things like uh, tree diseases. This is a cowrie disease in, in New Zealand, and this is a, a bark beetle population dynamics or bark beetle dynamics in Yosemite and the Sierra Nevada. Okay, so predator prey uh, dynamics again. Let's start with the equations. What we are doing here is introducing a second species to our um, system of population growth. So we're gonna growth. We're gonna look at two species simultaneously. And look at this. Here uh, is our prey population, the so-called victims um, in this uh, this writing of it. And that population growth rate times the population of the prey here is the exponential growth model. So there it is again. But what's been added here is some effect of predators, some um, rate at which predators consume prey. And that's um, an efficiency, how good they are at getting the prey, the number of prey uh, times the number of predators. And then the growth of the predators here, or the predator population dynamics in this case is a, a very much, very similar to exponential growth. It's just written a little bit differently because it's dependent on the prey, and then there's a um, mortality of the predators as well. You have to have that. Now, what happens with these is um, whenever you have two species, you have a point where population, um, a, a threshold where populations are increasing or decreasing. This is isoclines, and there's some separate information about that. But just want to just point out here that for the prey, um, if the predators, if there are too many predators, then the prey population is going to is going to decline. And likewise, if there are too few uh, under this threshold, the, the prey population will increase. You can show that's the isocline, the place the point where population growth rate is positive or negative. And you can do the same thing for the predators. It's we're putting it on a different axis here because they're different species. You know, the prey are down here on this axis, and the predators are here, but Likewise, if there are a lot of prey, then you can increase the number of predators, a lot of things to eat. But if there's very few prey, you would decrease the number of predators. All right? Not too bad, right? Some interesting things happen with these models, though, mathematically, when you, when you um, plot them. And that's that you have these kinds of um, oscillations. When the, predator, when the prey population is going up, the predator population will go up lagged. In, in a lagged fashion. So there is this um, 
uh, lag between the peaks of these two things. And that makes sense because once the predator population gets too high, it starts to drive down the prey population. And then that shifts the predators under their threshold for positive population growth. That's, this is all mathematical. This is just a mathematical rendition of this. But it happens in reality. And one of the better examples of this is the Canada lynx snowshoe hare population uh, dynamics. You may know about these. Um, these happen in the north. Here's this great video um, by the Canadian Wildlife Service. This is a lynx. I mean, this, this animal is just so cool. <laughs> you can look these up online. There's some really great videos, you know. Um, yeah, lynx doing lynx things, and uh, they're a lot of fun um, to watch. But anyway, so uh, point being here that I showed you a mathematical plotting of that model, but this is an example where uh, it, it, real life is not nearly as much is much more variable, messy, if you will, than uh, a mathematical model. But some of the same patterns are happening here. One is that. The peaks of, of snowshoe hare are lagged relative to lynx. And these are um, some famous data. They're, they're pelts um, collected over a long period of time. Um, but they've since been, there's been some validation of this, and it shows that the lynx populations really are quite dependent on the abundance of hare. Uh, hare are oftentimes more strongly controlled by uh, variation in the environment and their own carrying capacity. But there is this. There is this, the same kind of cyclic population dynamics and lags. Not nearly as famous, but, uh, but definitely um, uh, occurring are uh, the dynamics of prey and predators. This is a parasitoid wasp. It's parasitizing these aphids, these uh, crop pa uh, pests. And what you see here is as a lag oscillation of populations between prey and predator and um, a lag in their population dynamics. It actually happens quite a bit. And the reason for that, what happens is you actually end up having this cyclic population dynamic where, uh, you know, you've got the predators are scarce and the, the uh, prey start to grow, their populations start to grow rapidly. And then um, this, this, this whole system can cycle around if it's unperturbed from outside of, of that system, which doesn't happen very much, but it does happen sometimes in uh, natural ecosystems. Okay, so why is this relevant? Because this is part, a great, a great part of how things went so wrong on the Colorado Plateau. All predators were removed. What happened? The deer were unconstrained, but exponential growth cannot go on forever because they ate themselves out of house and home, consumed all of their um, resources, and then the populations crashed. Point being here, when we remove predators from this system, we revert to exponential growth, which you know cannot go on forever. So, you know, something has to give, and it absolutely did. There was nothing left to eat, and the whole, and the, the whole herd collapsed. Fortunately, it did not go extinct, but it was pretty ugly times. This is not the only example of this. Uh, another good example of this is uh, illustrated by the reintroduction of wolves into Yellowstone. Um, this is a really amazing story. They were extirpated from the park. This is such a weird photo. This is on Wikipedia. Um, and then re reintroduced in the 90s. Um, and the, the wolf, a couple of wolf packs, and they have been um, stable. Now, what's happened is you can see changes in not just uh, the elk populations, um, the, the, the browser populations here, but also changes in productivity within these ecosystems. One of the most important things that reintroducing wolves has done is actually to stabilize forest producti riparian forest productivity. And here's what's happening here. Um, the predators are reducing, herb they're basically restricting any kind of excessive herbivory in these forests. Uh, and that is has an indirect uh, protection, uh, ends up protecting the plant populations indirectly. The predators are not trying to protect riparian forests, if you will. Um, they're just trying to find something to eat. But 
the effect of that is that herbivores oftentimes avoid riparian forests because they're a good place for wolves to ambush um, prey. And uh, that ends up having the effect of protecting these stream ecosystems and even potentially stabilizing the stream banks. This is a, what's known as a, a trophic cascade. It's where one, one uh, level of the um, food chain here ends up uh, the actions of one chain, uh, one proportion of the food chain, in this case one removed, has an indirect but positive effect on a, on a uh, part of the food chain that's below. Essentially, the plants are being protected from a rivery by the action of predators.